Is Jesus Christ your living hope? Is he? All those songs, the first songs and the second songs, just made me think about what Nicodemus must have been thinking that night that he went to Jesus. Now, if you read on, you know, you'll get to think that he probably did realize the truth, that he probably did accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But as we are reading early on in John, Here's a religious man who cares about eternal life, who's lived his life trying to do things right, but he's so far from the light, he refuses to see that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are a mighty, wonderful God. We thank you for the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he can be our living hope if we truly put our faith and hope in Him, if we believe in Him and trust in Him rather than trusting in the things of this world. Father, we just thank You that You would give us a new spirit, a new heart, that we are born again, a new creation in Christ, to live a life that brings glory and honor to You as we were created and designed to do. We thank You for doing what we cannot do through Jesus Christ and through the power of Your Spirit. Lord, open our eyes today to hear your words and apply them to our lives. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you've been reading, you read a lot of wonderful things this week. <laughs> you read Sermon on the Mount. You read about the marriage, uh, a wedding festival in Canaan. You read about Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. The Old Testament, we've read all the way up to this point, pointing to all these things that Jesus Christ fulfilled, that He is the Messiah, the Chosen One, the Anointed One of God, that there is no doubt that there is any other name under heaven given to men whereby you might be saved. So how did Jesus begin His public ministry? He began it by telling you to repent. Those words that Nicodemus heard, those words that you've heard so many times, the words that John the Baptist said before Jesus said those words, repent, change your way of thinking so that you can change your heart, so you can change your attitude, so that you can serve God rather than serving yourself. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it reads this way. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, Preparing their nets, Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. See, they would have never done this if they hadn't have repented, if they hadn't have been preparing themselves for the Messiah, for this anointed one, that Jesus Christ was the answer to all your concerns. When you're weary, when you're defeated, when you lack hope, anything else, Jesus Christ is the answer. But you've got to repent so that you hear the gospel call. And what is the gospel call? Not that we just want a Savior, but that we live our lives for our Lord, that our lives are not our own. Everybody wants salvation, but do you believe in Jesus Christ's message? 
that you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Something that you could never do before, but now the power rests inside of you. Where you don't even have to do it on your own, God does it through you again. When you're weak, He is strong. When you humble yourself, He raises you up. This is the gospel message that Jesus was teaching. He is the one and He is the way. There is a way to this process that the first, first followers of Jesus followed after the way. They weren't called Christians till people mocked them and said, hey, look, they're Christians, they're acting like Christ. Who'd have known what a beautiful compliment that that was? That we're behaving in such a way that we are identified with Christ, who is God, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is calling you to follow him. What's holding you back? Oh, don't say there's nothing because then you'd be a liar <laughs> and that'd be holding you back just the same. Our fears, our doubts, our, our things in this world, there's ton, so many things that distract us. But scripture tells us to not let Satan get one foothold because when he gets a foothold, then he's got some leverage in your life. You need to come to Jesus and say, take it, take it from me. I trust in you who you are. Peter believed, right? But he still needed some miraculous catches to make sure that he realized what was going on. We read about one miraculous catch last week, and then Merle told us about another one today. He believed, but he has, still hadn't truly repented in his heart. If you spend time with Jesus, you'll see that he is who he says he is, that you'll see that all of his promises are true and trustworthy that you can count on Him where you can't count on things. But yet so many times we still continue to trust in those things. The more you spend time with Jesus, the more you'll see your need for repentance for what a wretched, sinful person you are. To where maybe if you spend enough time with Jesus, that His mission matters. It matters more than anything. That it matters more about catching men than it does about catching anything else in this world. In Luke chapter 5, we read that last week. It said, One day as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around Him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put into deeper water. I'm calling you to do more. And let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. We've done it under our own, our own might and strength. And, and what happened? We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. It's not a sin to have doubt, but it is a sin with what you might do with that doubt. He still followed Jesus' command because he knew that he was the Messiah. But he doubted. He relied on his own power and his own might. But he, then he sees a miraculous catch. I will let down my nets. I will obey you instead of just listening and not obeying. Verse 6. When they had done this, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Jesus said that he would make him a fisher of men, but here he's catching fish. He'd seen other miracles already, but yet this got him thinking, wait a minute, what did Jesus call me to do? He called me to be a catcher of men. What if I put my faith and trust in him? How many people could I catch instead of fish? Verse 7, So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Maybe Peter's remembering the words of Jesus where he said, I'll build my church upon you. Others are going to follow after you. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Now see, that's different from his calling before. From his calling before, he said, Oh, I, I know you're the Messiah. Let's get on board with this. But when he saw this miracle, it hit him at the heart. And he said, what a sinful, wretched man am I that you, my Lord, 
would come to call me to repentance. He didn't even know that Jesus would lay down his life, yet he didn't understand any of those things. But he said, I need to trust in you. And to trust in you, I need to repent and change my mind, realize how sinful I am, and realize that there's no way that I can achieve eternal life except by following after the Messiah. This is the message that's being taught. Verse 9, For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. Don't let your fears or anything else hold you. Because from now on, you will fish for people. Peter got it at this point. So they pulled their boats up on shore, and they left everything and followed them. Well, wait a minute, I thought they'd already done that. I thought they had left everything and followed him before. <laughs> but see, he was still holding on. He was still holding on to his career that supplied him money so that he wouldn't have to rely on Jesus for all of his needs. He realized at this point that he had to rely on Jesus and not Jesus plus, not Jesus sometimes, but Jesus and Jesus alone. And Jesus from this point would start teaching them more and more about how to fish for men. So I have a question. Do you realize what Jesus has saved you from? What you deserve. What your destiny is if you don't put your faith and trust in Jesus. Do you realize what Jesus has given you instead? That he's given you eternal life, but he's given you also a way to come and worship God the Father the way you were intended to be. To live a life that is not dominated and controlled by sin anymore because sin has no power over you. That you have to choose one master or the other. And do you realize what he has called you to do? The privilege and right that you have to be called children of God, to tell others, to show others, to be priests and a royal priesthood, to use your gifts to bring God glory and honor and to bring harmony to the body, to draw others to salvation. Do you realize these things? If you're reading through your Bible, if you're reading the New Testament now, and a couple of people have told me that they're trying now or they are now, woohoo! If you're reading, you're reading in chronological order. That means we're reading it in the way that the events unfolded. But if you've noticed something already, it's not exactly in chronological order, is it? I don't know why, I don't, but it's not. You read the miraculous catch of fish from Luke chapter 5 before you read about the wedding ceremony in Cana. That's backwards. The wedding ceremony in Cana happened before the miraculous catch. Huh. Did you catch that? Did you understand that? Well, I've printed out a couple more things to help you. They are a list of parables in order and a list of miracles in order. It's okay that the ESV chronological reading is not exactly chronological. It's still very helpful because you see these things put together. But the first miracle Jesus did, and it's, John says it, was when he turned water into wine at a marriage festival, a wedding celebration. Because what an appropriate thing to do is Jesus brought overflowing joy to a wedding. This event that brought a man and a woman together that Jesus would use as a symbol to bring his church as a bride to him. That no ceremonial cleansing needed to be done anymore because Jesus had cleaned you once and for all. As he told Peter, he said, all you need to do is wash your feet. The rest of you is clean. And the reason you need to wash your feet is just because they get dirty along the way that you're supposed to walk. But you're clean already. You're forgiven because of your faith in Jesus Christ. So at that marriage ceremony, at that, that wedding in Cana, this festival, we read in John chapter 2, starting in verse 1, On the third day a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mothers were there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to, to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Now we could debate on what that means all this time, but Jesus hadn't really started his 
public ministry as far as these miracles, these signs that John calls that were performed. These signs so that you would know that Jesus has power from on high. Some people, though, didn't want to believe that, so they said his power was from the devil. And he said, how can a house be divided? It won't stand. His miracles were proof that he had the power of God. But then what did he say beyond that? He had the power and spirit of Elijah and other prophets. But he said, I'm not just a prophet. I am God. I am the Messiah. I am God made flesh and dwelling among you, Emmanuel, God living with you. I have come to take away the sins of the world if you believe this message. But his hour had not yet come, whatever that means, but still he performed this miracle because it was the appropriate place to do it, to celebrate a marriage. What do you think Matthew was thinking when Jesus turned water into wine? Do you think he had that recall of himself being a sinner? Well, that's a trick question. Matthew wasn't even there, because if you're reading your reading, Matthew wasn't called till later. Now, he might have been there. I can't say he wasn't there, but he wasn't called by Jesus to be his disciple yet, because that comes in a little bit. How about at the miraculous catch of fish? What do you think Matthew was thinking then? Trick question because his calling is right after that again. Now, he might have been there watching and everything. Who knows? But when Jesus called him, he called him from his tax collector's booth because, again, he was holding on to the things of this world to give him the security that he needed. He had fear that if he left those things behind, what would he hold on to except for (laughs) Jesus Back to John chapter 2. I won't give you any trick questions anymore. You can look at these handouts to see when the miracles happen and stuff. And if if you'll notice on the miracles in chronological order, it shows you each reference and then see Matthew's calling is right about down in here, just so you know. Okay, just to make that clear. Back to John chapter 2. Verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs, John makes it clear, through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now that word believe is written almost a hundred times in the book of John. That's his purpose for writing, that you may believe. But there's a big difference between believing it's going to rain tomorrow and putting on your raincoat tomorrow and everything else, okay? This means that you believe without a shadow of doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. So if he is who he says he is, and if you believe it, you will put your faith and trust in him. If you don't, you doubt that belief, don't you? And John's clear in his writing about that. John 3.16 is a wonderful, wonderful verse, but it's smacked right in there where Nicodemus says he believes starting out that chapter. And Jesus answers his question that he never even asked. He says, you want eternal life? Then you don't believe the way I'm telling you to believe. The Gospel of John was written almost 50 to 60 years. I gave you that time frame in, in the bulletin the other day. After Jesus walked on the face of this earth, died, was raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven. Fifty, sixty years now had had passed. It's a miracle that John's writing doesn't contradict. It's been so long. It's an inspired work of God. Every word profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And he wrote this gospel so that you may believe. Believe in who Jesus Christ is. Believe in who you are in that relationship and your calling to live a holy life. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. In John chapter 20, these words John pens right after Jesus comes to Thomas and says, don't doubt. Believe me, you can see the the holes in my flesh. You can see that my body is real. I'm not, I'm not a ghost or anything else. That you can believe in eternal life. 
because I have died for your sins and I have raised back to life so that you can see that this is all possible with me. So in verse 29 of John chapter 20, it says, Jesus told Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. John remembers these words so many years later through all the persecutions and sufferings and things that he has been through for being a disciple, for being a Christian. He has lived to be a ripe old age and he has seen nothing but persecution for being called like his master, which Jesus told him. But yet he's still hopeful because he knows without a shadow of a doubt that he can put his faith and trust in Jesus. That what happens next is eternal life with God forever. So he writes this letter so that we may believe. If you go on, the very next verse says, in John 20, verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe. That you may believe what? That Jesus is the Messiah. That he's the way, the truth, and the life. That he is the answer. He has done for us what no man can do because he is the God-man God made, God made flesh and dwelling among us who lived a life without sin and laid down his life for us and told us to follow in his footsteps, to live a life empowered by the Spirit to do good works, to let sin have no dominion or power over us. That's the gospel calling for each and every one of us that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Salvation is a result of that believing. That reason that Nicodemus came to him at night in the darkness and said, I believe, but Jesus said, no, you don't. Back to John chapter 2. At the end of John chapter 2, and remember that chapters weren't there in the original writing, these are the last verses of John chapter 2, and then we'll read into John chapter 3. Verse 23, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he performed and believed in his name. In his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. If you continue reading in John chapter 3, now there was a Pharisee. The story continues right there because Jesus realized that Nicodemus is one of those who says he believes, but he doesn't believe to the point of salvation. He doesn't have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That word in verse 24, John 2 says, but Jesus would not entrust himself it's the same word that was used right before that, believing in His name. It's pisteo. It's what, what is translated the most as believe, nearly a hundred times in John. So when you say it this way, it sounds a little different. Jesus wouldn't believe in them because they didn't believe in Him. That's what it's saying. They believed in Him because they saw the miracles and everything, and they believed they wanted healing. They would bring the sick to them and the lame to them and everything else, but they didn't want to believe that he was the son of God because that part of the gospel message says, I need to respond. I need to come and follow after him and fish for men, not hold on to the things that I've held on to before. I need to repent and change my way of thinking so God can use me as his creation, not only his creation, but is redeemed by the blood of his son to be a new creation in Christ. Do you believe that? So Nicodemus came to him in John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee. So you can go to church every day. You can read your Bible every day. You can pray every day. You can do great works of righteousness. You can even cast out demons in Jesus' name, right? But then that's the same justification that many used on that day. When he said, depart from me, I do not know you because you didn't truly believe in me. You can even have these works of righteousness because it's not by works of righteousness which you've been saved, but by faith, by God's mercy and grace. 
that you believe and put your trust in Jesus. So John wrote these words, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. If anyone should be saved, if anyone should believe, it should be Nicodemus. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, teacher, one that I want to learn from, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. That's what I believe. I believe that you are a prophet but I'm not ready to put my faith and trust in you. I don't truly believe because I don't want to come out of the darkness and into the light because then my sins will be exposed. I would have to repent and realize what a wretched man I am without any hope. And he said, For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with them. No question asked here, nothing else, but here's Jesus' reply. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. He didn't even ask that. But see, Jesus would not entrust himself to Nicodemus. He didn't believe Nicodemus because he wouldn't come out of the darkness into the light. He said, I know you're of God, but I won't come and follow you. I don't want to be a fisher of men because I don't want to give up I don't want the cost, the persecution, anything else. I want salvation, but I don't want the rest of the gospel message. I don't know if you know it or not, but you can't stay hidden in the shadows. Scripture is clear. You have to come into the light to be a child of the light. And that is what Jesus has called us to be, to be a part of that kingdom, to to pledge our allegiance to that king to follow his rules and decrees. Those are the ones who believe and those are the ones that inherit eternal life. I'm not going to read all of John chapter 3. I'm going to jump to the end of this chapter. The last couple of verses say, verse 35, The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. It is finished with Jesus Christ. The answer lies with Him. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life because God's wrath remains on them. These are the words that Jesus said to Nicodemus because he didn't want anyone to perish, even a righteous man. And he sure didn't want sinners to perish because that's the ones who need a physician because he called those to repentance. He calls all men to repentance. Well, as you read this week, you read the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, and all these different things, but I'm not going to concentrate on them. You need to read them for yourself. I want to go to the end of John again, to the, to the words that Merle read this morning. John chapter 21, verse 3 to 6. It's kind of ironic that there's a catch of fish at the end, is there not, of the book of John. Maybe, just maybe, John is trying to say, don't, don't, don't rely on the things that you relied on before. Trust Jesus in a new and special way to really see joy in your life that you thought this brought before, to really see rewards in your life that you thought you saw before security, health, everything else, because there's a new way following after Jesus so that you can catch the things that really matter. In John chapter 21, verse verse 3, Peter says, I'm going out to fish. And his friends followed him, right? It's the thing to do. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. I wonder what Peter was thinking. Remember last time we didn't catch anything? I wonder. No, I, I don't know. But they didn't catch anything. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, because he calls us friends who know him. Haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Now, spoiler alert again, I'll tell you what's going to happen here. But as you're reading there, 
You'll remember that Peter has denied Jesus. Well, no, he says he's not going to do that. And Jesus reinstates Peter for this gospel call, his mission to fish for people. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? Because if you did, you wouldn't hold on to these other things. You'd put your faith and trust in me and you'd follow after me. Feed his sheep. Don't worry about the things that you did before. Feed Jesus' sheep. Bring them into the fold. Catch men instead of catching fish. And Peter went on boldly from there. Now, of course, he didn't do it as boldly as he did once he got the Holy Spirit because that's again where our power comes from. But now Peter's heart has been prepared. He's seen Jesus. He trusts in Jesus. He's repented of his sins. And he walks in the power of the Spirit even when Jesus has gone back to heaven. When Jesus isn't here anymore in the flesh. And he probably remembers those words that Jesus said that you will do greater things than these because the power of the Spirit that resides upon you, because you can work together as the body of Christ, because you have a mission and a calling. A miraculous catch of fish to show a miraculous lifestyle that we're supposed to live catching men. The last words that you read this week were a call to repentance again and your mission. You read from Matthew chapter 11. Verse 20 says, And Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of His miracles had been performed. Okay, the Scripture tells us about where miracles weren't performed because of their lack of faith. But this says right here in the town where His miracles had been, had been performed. He denounced the towns because they did not repent. And since they did not repent, they could not believe and they could not live this life that they were created and bought back to live. They were not born again. They would not inherit eternal life. Jesus goes to, on to say, Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe. You saw these miracles, but you didn't repent and believe and come and follow me. For if the miracles were performed in you that had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, these wicked cities in the past that we read about in the Old Testament, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Whoa, these wicked cities, and it's going to be more bearable for them. And you, Capernaum, will, be lift, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom. Remember what happened to Sodom. You read it. I hope you read it. They rained down fire and sulfur from heaven upon them. It will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. All the Old Testament prophecies tell us about the day of the Lord the day that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins and called you to follow after Him, and the day that Jesus Christ will return and bring either reward or judgment. Don't be afraid to live your life in confidence, to live your life without fear. You don't need to fear men. You don't need to fear where your next paycheck comes from, your next meal comes from. Jesus is clear. He says, doesn't the Heavenly Father take care of sparrows? And aren't you worth so much more than, than birds that were literally paid nothing for for offering? The last words of that chapter of Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 say, Come to me. The same calling that Jesus said when he first met those men. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest in this world, John is proof of that because he's lived a life nothing but persecution and, and he writes words to love Jesus and to trust Jesus. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, not just in this world, but for all eternity. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew is penning these words because he realized the same thing in his tax collector booth. And when Jesus called him, he left all of his securities, all the sin, everything behind and followed after Jesus. Most Christians won't give up things for Jesus. They think they can have Jesus and have the things that they had before. But that's not the gospel message. Jesus calls you to do te o piso mu, which means to forsake all and come after Him. To put your trust in Him, and then He'll make you fishers of men. You'll experience a wonderful catch that you never, ever experienced or never, ever thought possible. Will you come to Jesus and follow after Him? Father in heaven, we thank You and praise You that You are a most gracious God that your plan is perfect in every way, that Jesus Christ did come and do what we could never do for ourselves, and that it is by believing, by trusting, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ that we can be sons and daughters of the Most High. Lord, help us to realize what Jesus did, what He's saving us from, what He's calling us to, so that we can live a life empowered by your Spirit to draw men to you, Lord, we thank you for taking care of us so much. And Lord, in this world where we have so plenty, so much, that we're, it's abounding, Father. Help us to not be complacent, but to share the things that you've given us, to tell others about Jesus Christ, to use every opportunity that we have, especially as the day approaches of Jesus' return, to bring glory and honor to you. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.